And thank you to my colleague for handling that so ably. Um, my name is Rebecca Shute. I'm the executive director of CGS, Citizens for Global Solutions, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, non-governmental organization headquartered in Washington, DC, with the goal of advancing democratic world federation predicated on peace, justice, and the rule of law. And so I can think of no more fitting topic for today's discussion, especially at a critical juncture for our country and for the world than what we have today looking at the Global Peace Index. Um, so I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce our guest speaker, Michael Collins, and the Institute for Economics and Peace, uh, which he represents. Um, the Institute for Economics and Peace is a global think tank headquartered in Sydney with branches in New York, Mexico City, and Oxford, which studies the relationship between peace, business, and prosperity, and seeks to promote understanding of the cultural, economic, and political factors that drive peacefulness. And um, I think your vision and mission, um, uh, Michael, so clearly ascribed to the values on which CGS was founded in 1945, I will just say that we are a membership-based organization. Programming like this is entirely dependent on the contributions of our members. Um, my colleagues will in, uh, include in the chat um, how you can become a member if you are not already and how you can contribute to make programming like this possible. Michael manages IEP's relations with the US government and the United Nations and develops working partnerships with US-based civil society organizations, foundations, universities, businesses, and think tanks, and seeks new opportunities to build IEP's presence and impact throughout the Americas. And prior to working with IEP, Michael helped develop and oversee educational and job creation programs in emerging nations recovering from natural disasters, working frequently in communities affected by poverty and gang violence. So Michael is here to discuss the 2024 Global Peace Index, and there will be lots and lots of resources for you in the chat as the conversation goes on, including most importantly, of course, to the report itself. Um, and I will just use moderator's privilege to editorialize for a moment and say how important this report is at this particular time. Um, I think often those of us who follow peace, follow war, follow conflict, follow international humanitarian law, um, but aren't very close to it as scholars, um, are driven by maybe instinct or bias or media coverage about the state of the world and its bellicoseness or its um, pacificness, uh, pacificity, excuse me, how peaceful or warlike it is. And um, when an inordinate amount um, of coverage is placed on some conflicts, others, of course, um, are in the shadows. And likewise, the good news stories where um, uh, conflicts may have de-escalated or mitig been mitigated or been prevented, um, we don't often get to see or hear or interact with those stories. And thus, it is all the more important that a data-driven project um, really looks uh, intimately at the state of the world and its peacefulness. Um, so the GPI, as you will hear, ranks 163 independent states and territories collectively accounting for 99.7% of the world's population according to their levels of peacefulness. And it has become a barometer that is looked to by policymakers as well as scholars and civil society actors the worldwide um, as a metric for us to do our work. And so we are indebted um, to IEP um, and the many scholars who contribute to this report. Um, so I'm looking forward with you to engaging more with Michael. And I do have to say as an apology at the outset that I will leave you about halfway through the discussion or at 12.30, my Eastern Standard Time for another engagement. And um, please do not take this in any way as the lack of CGS's commitment to this partnership and you will be in excellent hands with my colleagues, Drea Klein Bergman, and those who are currently behind the scenes, James Lowell May and Hannah Fields. So with that, I give the floor to you, Michael. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Rebecca and, and everyone. It's a wonderful opportunity to be here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and share my um, my screen here. Uh, you know, one of the interesting things that you noted in your initial uh, comments, Rebecca, was sort of the similarities really between the ethos and the mission um, of um, of the organizations. And I kind of sort of really wanted to highlight that uh, as well. In fact, I kind of sort of brought up 
uh, a bit of information about uh, CGS. You know, obviously very much focused on, on peace. Our, our role or our mission is to create a paradigm shift in the way that the world uh, sees peacefulness. Uh, and of course, um, you know, peace is central to everything that um, GCS does. Um, and um, uh, the human rights and rule of law component, as we will see a bit further on in the presentation, um, is absolutely key. Uh, as well. Uh, forgive me, I think I uh, put the uh, acronym backwards on that one. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to say very quickly is that one of the things that I noted on is this sort of emphasis of connecting the the the, the global to the local, which is very much a focus of IEP um, as well. This is kind of sort of just a bit of a, a promotional slide, but the, 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 the core message here is you're in good hands. So there's a lot of stuff that we don't know. Um, you know, unfortunately, when we sort of look at, you know, peacefulness or conflict for that matter, globally, it's very, very difficult to be able to find um, data that is strong enough and that is comprehensive enough to be able to drive significant insights. So there are significant limitations to all forms of data. Um, we are um, totally transparent in the way that we collect the data, the sources that we use, the data trends, and the limitations within it as well. So if you consult any IP report, you'll see a full breakdown of the methodology in the back of the report uh, for, for, for picking out as you as you see fit. Um, if I had to kind of sort of grossly simplify the, the, the work of, of the Institute, um, we're focused on trying to answer this particular question here. What are the world's, uh, some of the world's most peaceful countries? Um, and the follow on and perhaps even more important question is this one here. What is it that those particular countries have in common? And the premise of that is that if we can understand what helps to create sustained peacefulness, then we're able to sort of replicate that in our own countries, independently of how peaceful they may be. So our effort to um, answer that first question, um, what are the world's most peaceful countries, is the basis for the Global Peace Index, which is our sort of core flagship report. Now, the, the story behind it is somewhat um, apocryphal. The, uh, the founder of the, the Institute um, made a lot of money uh, early on in, um, in the early computing days, opened a charitable foundation, which um, to this day does a lot of famine relief work and works with child soldiers um, in sub-Saharan Africa as well as uh, uh, South Asia. Um, and he was walking through Northeast Kivu in the Congo and asked, what are some of the world's most peaceful countries? And at the time, none of this information um, existed. And of course, the realization was, well, if we can't sort of measure peace and see how peace is changing, well, how do we know whether it's becoming, things are becoming more peaceful, less peaceful? And more importantly, how do we know if what we're doing is actually helping or hindering the progress of peace around the world? So that was the genesis of, of, of the idea. Um, the Global Peace Index itself, and thank you very, very uh, much again, Rebecca, for the, the description, covers 163 countries, the ones that you can see here. And it uses 23 different indicators that each have globally comparable data across all of these different ones. And we do it across three domains. So we look at issues of conflict, right? Some of the stuff that you would invariably see in the news day to day, um, but also sort of internal societal measures of safety and security. Um, so things like, for example, political instability, violent crimes, uh, violent demonstrations, uh, homicide rates, incarceration rates, to give some examples here. The third domain that we look at is levels of militarization. Now, you know, that can sometimes be contentious in, in some fields, especially when, um, you know, uh, the, the, the focus of the military um, may be to, to avoid a war, for example, right? The analogy that I would draw here is the equivalent of feeling the need to have a gun at home. So even though it may keep us safer, it's symptomatic of a lack of peacefulness in the sense that it is what we define in this instance as negative peace, the absence, the fear of violence, sorry, violence or fear of violence. So the Global Peace Index measures the absence of violence or fear of violence. And the idea is that any country that is more peaceful is low on measures of conflict, is low on measures of homicide, and is also low on levels of militarization, for example, right? It's low on all of these things showing higher levels of peacefulness. Again, we try not to do this from a moral perspective. We very much look at the data, looking at these particular indicators to see what is driving changes in peacefulness over time. So we can kind of sort of do some cool stuff, which is throw all of this stuff in a bucket and, um, and, and squeeze it out um, and tell us if the world is becoming more or less 
useful globally. So it deteriorated last year and it has in fact been deteriorating for quite some some time. We can look at which are the countries that are becoming more or less peaceful. Um, if we'd look back in 2019, for example, around five years ago, um, these numbers would have been switched. Almost 90, almost 100 countries became more peaceful then and 65 deteriorated. That switched over the last five years. So we've seen a significant deterioration in, in peacefulness. More conflicts um, today uh, than there have been anywhere, any um, any time since the the, um, the end of the Second World um, War. A record of conflict deaths in 2022. Um, um, almost that number in 2023, uh, and a and a, a bad start to this year as well. Um, we can sort of look at those individual um, indicators and kind of sort of see what's driving the changes in score. Um, so, you know, after sort of the wave of violent demonstrations globally after the COVID-19 pandemic, for example, that's something that's that's improved. Um, the impact of terrorism around the world has uh, decreased overall, um, but it has become sort of more compartmentalized. So it's significantly worse in a smaller amount of countries. The homicide rates around the world, for the most part, have continued to improve, uh, although in the case of uh, uh, Canada, for example, it's a, a country where it has deteriorated. There are a number of uh, South American countries where homicides have deteriorated significantly as well. And sort of the broad finding here is that we're starting to see this trend in militarization shifts. Of course, that's become a lot more evident in the last three months since the release of the Global Peace Index. Um, um, but it is a distinct change. So as you'll see in a graph in a little while, over the last 10 years, the world had become significantly less militarized. That is shifting markedly now. And of course, this increase in conflict deaths that I referred to before. So here is kind of sort of the, um, you know, the top 10 most peaceful countries in 2024. Now, of course, there's a there's a whole spectrum here, right? I'm just sort of showing the top 10 here. But for example, in uh, Asia Pacific, Japan, Vietnam, Australia, they do pretty well. Uh, in South Asia, Bhutan, for example, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, Mauritius, Madagascar, Botswana are all relatively uh, peaceful countries. Uh, Kuwait, Qatar, Oman in the Middle East, Argentina in South Africa, uh, outside of the top 50 countries like Uruguay and Costa Rica, relatively peaceful um, as well. Uh, as it happens, though, most of these countries actually deteriorated in um, peace last year. So the only ones that improved were Singapore, Malaysia and uh, Switzerland out of these um, 10. Uh, for all of you um, asking yourselves the question, the United States does horribly <laughs> in the global peace index. So it currently ranks 132nd out of 163 countries. It does have very high levels of homicide uh, compared to the global average. It's got one of the highest incarceration rates in the world. Um, and its militarization uh, uh, score does drive a large part of that low score as well. Um, now, if we look at sort of the bottom end of the of the index, um, these are some of the countries that you would see, um, a number of which are in the in the headlines. But if you look slightly above, a lot of them are, are not. You know, Rebecca was talking about the conflicts that we hear about and the ones that we don't. You know, we're not hearing much about conflicts in Ethiopia these days, right? Um, we're hearing relatively little about the conflict in in Sudan, even though in these cases. Um, practically more people are dying or died in Ethiopia in 2022 than died in the Ukraine, for example. More people died in from terrorism than Burkina Faso um, than, um, than, uh, than anywhere, any other country in the world last year. There's a lot of stuff that we don't hear about. Now, using those same metrics, we can also sort of look at some of the countries that are improving over the last year um, as well. So um, some interesting things to, to, to note here. Um, and just because a country is improving doesn't mean that it is peaceful right now, right? So for example, if we look at El Salvador or Nicaragua, they actually retain relatively low levels of peacefulness, but they have had a significant improvement. Now, the case of, of El Salvador is interesting <laughs> because um, what we've seen is we've seen this great reduction in the amount of homicide. We've seen a massive reduction in the amount of violent crime, and we've seen a great increase in the perceptions of safety within the population. Now, all of that has come at a price, 
which drives its score negatively, in this case, mass incarceration, right? Up to 1% of the population is currently uh, incarcerated, many of whom, and I'm but I'm pretty sure not all, um, are related to, um, to, to gangs, right? So that, for example, at the moment is driving this improvement um, in peacefulness. But as you'll see when we move into sort of that second part of the question that I mentioned before, there's a question as to whether this is a short-term improvement or whether it can then sort of flourish into something more long-term, which is going to need to take into account other things in addition to these hard security responses right now. So on the flip side, of course, we can look at some of the most um, deteriorated countries and perhaps um, no major surprises um, here, uh, Ecuador is suffering a significant amount of uh, um, uh, gang violence, largely due to, to changes in the uh, drug trafficking in the uh, uh, channels in the continent. Um, Gabon had a, a notable coup last year, and of course, uh, Palestine and Israel are currently still at war. Um, so most of the regions uh, deteriorated in the Global Peace Index last year. Um, uh, Surprisingly, Russia and Eurasia improved. Now, that doesn't, that's the name of the region rather than the countries. Both Russia and the Ukraine deteriorated in peacefulness, but a number of the stand countries improved in, um, in peacefulness, leading to that um, improvement overall. Um, North America, um, which is always a bit of a data glitch because it only includes two countries, Canada and the United States. So it's not always a fair comparison, but that has deteriorated significantly. Both Canada and the United States deteriorated in all three global peace index domains last year. Uh, Europe deteriorated in peace last year, although it does remain the most peaceful uh, region in the world. Um, and here's that graph that I quickly referred to before. So that green graph that you look here on the um, on the top here is one representing the increase in conflict that we've seen essentially here since 2010. Safety and security measures globally have remained largely the same, but here you can sort of see this uptick in militarization, um, which is very clearly going to increase uh, in our report next year. And the unfortunate thing here is that, of course, this sort of is on the back end of what had been an improvement in militarization. In other words, we had become less militarized. Now, there's no direct correlation between this increase in conflict and militarization, even though it is a very logical response. So it's, it's logical that as people sort of see this graph here, um, that we would see um, you know, that the, the expectation would be to increase. Now, the rule of law component, and of course, a core um, uh, a core element of the work of CGS um, is, is absolutely critical, especially in what we call the mid-tier countries. But a militarized response is also a short-term response as well. A couple of kind of sort of nuances um, to these dynamics. Um, if we look at the overall number of amount of conflict around the world, we've seen this great increase in what we call internationalized intrastate conflict. So these are conflicts in which um, a number of states are participating. So, for example, if you take, um, you know, if you take uh, Russia and Ukraine, not only is Ukraine receiving uh, direct military support from the likes of the European Union or the United States, but of course, Russia is receiving direct support from various parties, including most recently North Korea. So this is a very good example of how a, a conflict has become more internationalized. And this has become a lot more common. And this extends to even peacekeeping missions, right? So if we think of um, Kenyan troops deployed in Haiti, um, would account for some of this as well. What does this mean? It means that a lot more parties are involved in conflict, making them significantly more difficult to resolve. So if we, if we look at the amount of peace agreements, for example, that has dropped significantly from memory from around 25% to about 5% um, uh, today uh, since, uh, as you can see here, the 1950s over the last 50 years. And importantly, the amount of conflicts that have been resolved by the overwhelming victory of either the non-state actor or the government has significantly dropped too, from almost 50% to less than 10% today. So the core kind of sort of net result of that is this great increase in some of this green stuff that you see here, which is essentially unresolved conflict. It may not be, you know, there may not be any immediate conflicts this, this year, any major amount of deaths right now, but it is a simmering conflict that has significant likelihood of um, flaring up in the near future. In fact, if you look at, for example, Russia and Ukraine, if you look at um, 
uh, Ethiopia, um, if you look at um, at uh, Gaza, right, in Israel, all of these would be example would have been examples of minor conflicts back in two thousand and nineteen. Say. So to end on sort of that, uh, the, 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 the data front, I suppose you could say, at least as it pertains to the Global Peace Index, we always end up with the calculation of the economic uh, impact of, of violence, uh, which trillions are almost $20 trillion uh, last year and continues to increase uh, over time, uh, representing uh, close to 15% of the world's GDP. So, you know, should we have the capacity, the ability to be able to increase, improve peacefulness uh, globally, there is significant economic benefit to be able to do so. Which brings me um, to question number two. If we are to take it um, face value that the Global Peace Index provides us with a measure of peacefulness globally, one of the things that we can do from a data-driven perspective is then run statistical analysis to be able to see what socioeconomic and attitudinal cultural components um, correlate with improvements in peacefulness. So as one thing wiggles on the left-hand side, what is it that is wiggling at the same time on the other side? To try and give us some data-driven insights as to what helps create and sustain peacefulness globally. So this forms the basis for a parallel report, a new one we're going to be uh, launching in, in December. It's called the Positive Peace Report. We've been doing it for about 15 years. Um, it's used uh, over uh, almost 25,000 different sort of data sets and looked at those core correlations that exist. Which are the things that exist? We start from the premise that we really don't know. For all we know, it could be waking up in the morning, you know? Okay, let's, let's compare a waking up in the time we wake up in the morning index to the Global Peace Index and let's see if there's a correlation. That's the premise. We try and avoid having a sort of a moral perspective or an ethical perspective or a religious one for that matter. So there were over 500 indicators that showed this strong correlation with improvements in peacefulness over time. Now, we continue to do factor analysis, essentially a clumping of these different indicators together to simplify. Um, and ultimately, this framework emerged, which we call these eight pillars of positive peace. It's largely intuitive, as you, as you, will, as you will no doubt see, but there's also some very interesting nuances to it. Countries that become more peaceful tend to make improvements in all of these pillars that you see here. They have a well-functioning government, peaceful transition of power, for example, uh, the provision of rule of law, absolutely critical, or the adequate provision of public services, for example. Uh, good relations with neighbors, with neighboring states, in the case of the United States between Mexico and Canada, for example. Uh, acceptance of the rights of others and as related, uh, issues related to gender equity, for example. Gender equity correlates very strongly with improvements in peacefulness, socioeconomic exclusion, um, High levels of human capital refers to human productivity, um, professional and personal development opportunities, and other pillars such as the ones that you can see here. Now, what are some of the sort of the interesting um, nuances? Well, the first one is that it's kind of systemic in nature. The countries that improve in peacefulness, they make small changes to all of these pillars simultaneously, rather than encouraging or making a significant shift in one of these pillars. All of these different pillars are interconnected and interrelated, hence we kind of sort of draw these cobwebs that you see here. Whenever there is a shift in one pillar, it has an impact on the other pillars as well. So being more conscious of that impact in whatever which way can significantly improve your peace building potential, whether you're a policymaker, whether you're a practitioner, understanding the implications of our actions based across these eight pillars of positive peace can have a transformational effect on the way that we um, not only look at peacefulness, but also try to improve peace over time. And just to reiterate that this is kind of sort of empirically based um, with all of the stated uh, limitations, of course. Um, but it is... Um, quite simple. And the way that it describes something that's quite complex when we think of social systems in a relatively simple way. And as such, we propose it as a tool that can help serve either policymakers or individuals in finding new ways to build peacefulness. Now, thinking of it geopolitically, um, what are the potential um, uses of something like positive peace? So in the Positive Peace Report, we actually produce positive peace scores for countries. 
looking at 24 indicators, three from each pillar, um, to give us a good indication of levels of positive peace within that particular country. We can then actually look at that compared to the global peace index, and we have what we call a deficit surplus model. So if a country is currently ranking very well in peacefulness today, but has low levels of positive peace, it's a clear indication that there is going to be a deterioration in peacefulness later on, right? Because the underpinnings of society are not there to be able to sustain its current levels of peacefulness. Now, the contrary is also true. If, for example, a country is currently in, in conflict or alternatively has um, peace-related challenges, if it has a high positive peace score, it has a high likelihood that it's going to be improving in peacefulness as well. So this is to give you an example of countries that had a significant positive peace deficit. For example, um, in 2009, let's say Sierra Leone, um, but um, was doing relatively well in peacefulness at the time. It had a significant deterioration um, since. Now, it's not an exact science. It never is. Um, and it's, it's dangerous to point to a single country, which I just did, admittedly, and I apologize to Sierra Leone personally for it. But um, if we look at this as a bucket of countries, these are the countries that had a positive peace deficit back then. As you can see, the great majority of these, almost 90%, deteriorated in peacefulness since. So if we're looking for a prevention window, if we're looking for something that's going to help give us an idea of what are the countries that are going to be deteriorating in the next three to five years, positive peace provides a tool to be able to sort of um, uh, do that in a more comprehensive way. So here's a quick snapshot, for example, of some of the current countries that have what we call this positive peace cool. deficit. Now, just to caveat that this, of course, doesn't include a lot of countries that are already in conflict. And one of the reasons is that conflict does a very quick job of destroying positive peace. So as, when, and if countries have extended forms of conflict, positive peace, which is something very difficult to build, is not something that is um, that um, uh, takes as long to, to destroy. Um, and it is one of the reasons why a lot of countries get caught in this sort of conflict trap, right, in which they just don't have the capacity to be able to sort of rebuild the levels of resilience um, uh, and governance that are necessary to be able to build positive peace in an integral way. When we work with different countries, we kind of sort of, you know, help them break down different indicators um, that they're interested in according to the eight pillars of, of positive peace to come up with sort of better decisions and policies related um, to, to their work. But I wanted to end today just by talking from the global to the local. How can something like the pillars of positive peace conceivably be used at the local level? This on the left-hand side that you can see here is a conversation in uh, Colombia with uh, reintegrated members of the, the FARC, the guerrilla forces there, and victims of the Colombian conflict, talking about how we can help build positive peace in our community. This is a small rural community called Alpacitas in Colombia. So something like positive peace can be used sort of for this process of context analysis. Um, yes, it's derived from the, the macro, um, and it doesn't pretend to assume that what applies at the macro applies at the local, but it does provide a framework for exploration. What score would we give our community in each of these different pillars in low levels of corruption, in sound business environment, in free flow of information, for example? Um, you know, what things have improved or deteriorated in our community in this way? And of course, in the United States, we can think about this as well, right? In our own neighborhood, in our own campuses, in our own colleges, what, are, what particular aspects of that? It's, it's easy to say, it's, to say peacefulness has deteriorated or, or peacefulness has improved or things have got worse. But especially when we're trying to unpack solutions, being able to break it out into these separate chunks can be a very valuable tool. And of course, that allows us to be able to then prioritize sort of particular actions as well. And from a project um, perspective, this is a workshop um, with uh, communities from the West Side in Chicago suffering very high levels of, of gun violence. Um, you can focus in on a particular activity. And the important thing then becomes understanding how all of these pillars connect. If I am doing an activity related to um, let's say, well-functioning government, for example, right, or acceptance of the rights of others. When I do that activity, what is the potential implication in the other pillars of peace? And how can I adjust or modify or think about my activity in a way that is going to benefit the other pillars too, to make sure that we're not having any negative unintended consequences?
Um, this is a quick photo of the, uh, the, uh, the Mexican police. We work with both the Mexican police and the Mexican military. Uh, recently, we're working with the, uh, the, the Philippines uh, military um, as well. Um, and one of the broad benefits of um, being data-driven, um, despite the limitations, is that it sort of provides this um, neutral starting point. Um, it's kind of sort of got these eight different things that hopefully everyone feels at home in, right? Everyone feels that driven towards a particular pillar. Sound business environment always motivates me significantly, for example. It allows us to be able to consider very complex issues in a relatively simple way. Um, and throughout all of our experience, it's been something that's been seen as non-political and culturally sensitive as well. So we very much focus uh, on this. And of course, we've only just had a sort of a very brief snapshot, but we're uh, delighted to continue um, to um, to uh, uh, collaborate with our partners at, uh, at CGS on this um, and to help participants, including participants today, to become architects of their own um, piece. So I realize that we're going to be opening up for questions and discussion, but I wanted to go ahead and leave you with a question, um, which is, um, how are you uh, contributing to a more positive piece? Because invariably, you are. So with that, um, I hand back over to the team and very much look forward to engaging in conversation. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, everyone, I'm Drea Bergman, the Director of Programs for CGS. Um, so I will be assisting with the moderating of the Q&A today. Um, Michael, this walking through us, this report and these, these critical um, uh, indicators has been so helpful. Thank you so much. And also I want to, to highlight before we move into the Q&A portion um, that Michael has been bringing this invaluable knowledge of these eight pillars of peace to one of our youth programs for the past three cohorts in Washington, DC. So I think this is a great time to mention to, to everyone here that the IEP does have a peace academy and uh, my colleague will then um, put that link in the chat for everyone. Um, so moving on to the Q&A portion, uh, and this is a first come first serve basis. Uh, Michael will be answering questions from both the Q&A function. I see some people have been um, uh, putting things in the chat and we're grabbing those. But if anyone would like to raise their virtual hands, we can unmute you. And so we'll be going back and forth between those to try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, so, you know, we're just asking if you're speaking that you limit your comments or questions to just one with a brief intervention so that everyone has this opportunity to engage with Michael today. So with that, Michael, I will ask the first question uh, from the Q&A. It's actually from Rebecca. Um, so her question is, what is the correlation between peace and democracy slash human rights? And how often are they linked? And how frequently do they stem conflict come from the expense of others and freedoms? Yeah, excellent question, Gia. Um, so there is actually a strong correlation between um, uh, democracy and improvements in peacefulness. One of the reasons that we perhaps don't use it uh, more is because it's often a triggering, it's often a triggering world, uh, especially a word, especially when what you're trying to do is you're trying to build peacefulness in perhaps some of the world's most authoritarian regimes, for example. Um, but we do see, um, looking at the index overall, um, that uh, more democratic, uh, the most peaceful countries tend to be more democratic in nature, and the less peaceful countries tend to be more authoritarian in nature. You may have seen some snippets of that in the top 10 and the uh, uh, and the bottom uh, ten, but the uh, the um, the rest is also true for everything in the middle. Thank you. Um, and I see we've got some raised hands, so I'm going to go over um, and allow them to talk. It looks like Lee Davis. Um, I'm going to unmute you. You can go ahead and ask your question. I think she has to unmute herself. Yeah. Oh. Are we unmuted? Yes, yes, we can hear you, Lee. Go ahead. Uh, this is Ron. Uh, we're watching together with Lee. I'm watching together with Lee. 
Um, in reading a nation or a uh, culture uh, on uh, peacefulness, what role does the um, prevalence of violence as a part of the culture uh, make a difference? So, for example, in the United States, um, there are violent sports. Um, there is uh, a great deal of violence in the media, etc. Uh, does that come into play in your ratings? Thank you very much for that question. And, um, you know, it's funny, we um, obviously it's just been just been Halloween um, and um, and I was in a shop and there was a uh, there was a, a, a dagger, you know, it was a glow in the dark dagger. And it said something along the lines of I can't remember the name of it, but it was like for three plus right for kids three years old and more. And then it's something it said like, learn, grow and play. And they had this picture of this child with the dagger and with this like sort of serial killer um, face. And I, and I wondered that exact question, right? Number one, what have we become? Um, and then number two, how likely that is to then drive. Um, now, all of that would be conjecture on, on my part. We do have some upcoming analysis that I'm not entirely across around the media and peace, for example. Um, intuitively, I would say that it does have a, you know, it does have a significant um, uh, impact in the same way that, um, you know, having a gun invariably leads to more gun violence, gun violence, right? Um, so intuitively, I would say that that is that is the case, but unfortunately, that's not something that we delve into the uh, delve into the the, the data. Uh, in fact, we kind of sort of take a step back from that ascribing sort of cult, you know um, uh, violence tendencies to cultures. What we try and do is we try and sort of start taking that out of the equation and saying, okay, well, where is violence high? Where is violence low? And then, of course, people reach their own conclusions based on the data that we provide. But it's a very good question, Mark. Agreed. And uh, so now we'll um, move into one of the questions from the chat from Scott. How do the pillars of positive peace spotlight, spotlight ecological services and the ecological systems of nations? There seems to be a blind sight here. Yeah, so um, I defer in this instance, uh, actually, to another upcoming report that we're going to be uh, at. So we, we have our launch event on, on, on Monday. If you're in Washington, D.C., uh, we would absolutely love having you there. It's actually a hybrid event. And that uh, delves into the ecological com component in quite some uh, detail. It's called the Ecological Threat Report. We've been producing it for, for five years. Now, it doesn't entirely answer your question, but what it does do is it does sort of focus in on that and the correlations between ecological degradation um, and deteriorations in peacefulness. We do see a significant correlation between ecological threats, um, uh, including environmental change uh, and aspects such as climate change, for example, and a deterioration in peacefulness over time. Uh, if it if it doesn't come through uh, clearly in something like the positive peace framework, for example, is that the, the, the data is simply not there to be able to sort of show that in, in this way at that time, for example, taking something similar as enough as, um, you know, carbon, carbon emissions, right? One can um, calculate or otherwise uh, estimate the number of carbon emissions, but understanding the impact of those carbon carbon emissions and specifically on what country and where is significantly more complicated. So um, we do see, interestingly, though, that countries with higher measures of positive peace do have better, um, a number of, of um, better environmental outcomes um, and also the ability to, to increasingly reduce uh, current environmental Pollution. Um, so there are some some correlations there, um, but uh, aren't particularly impacted in this report. Thank you. Um, and then one more from the from the chat before moving over to uh, Dr. Emma Osong. I see you have your virtual hand raised for your intervention. So the question from David is: Because peace is not just the absence of war or violence, but also the presence of law. How does the GPI take into account the element of respect for the rule of law in legal institutions and countries globally? Yeah. So um, this would be so the core difference between some, the global peace index and the positive peace index is in the definition of peacefulness. So when we look at the global peace index, um, 
we're talking about the absence of violence or fear of violence. Now, that's a superficial definition, but it allows us to start measuring something. Positive peace refers to the attitudes, institutions, and structures that create sustained peace. Now, we assume that rule of law, for example, is something that contributes to peacefulness, um, you know, potentially for the reasons that Rob described um, prior. But the premise of the work is that we don't know that. Let's check it, first of all, right? When we look at um, rule of law as a component and we look at the data that's available on that front and we run it against the global peace index, where is there, are, where is, where are, where is there less crime? Where is there less homicide? Where there is less violent demonstrations, for example? Um, oh, well, actually, rule of law is a core component of that. So, yes, rule of law is strongly correlated with improvements in peacefulness, especially in what we call sort of these mid-peace countries that benefit or, or, stat, or that, that require um, a, a well-functioning government with rule of law being an element of that. Now, the only caveat to that, I would say, is that that is by no means the only thing. And, you know, bringing back in that example of Salvador again, right, um, that is a core element but of course, all of the other elements of positive peace need to be worked on as well. And we need to make sure that when we are implementing various forms of, 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 uh, of rule of law, that what we're not doing is actually curtailing rights um, of certain amounts of the population that will then lead to the grievances and, and conflict overall. Um, so yes, I mean, that very much feeds into the respect that people have for, for rule of law. If you are to be respected as a government, um, and for your, you know, your police to be respected, then as a government and potentially as a police force, you also need to be doing other things outside um, of that area as well, which is where positive peace comes in. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David, for the question. Thank you, Michael. Um, as always, Michael, you just have such a, a brilliant way of honing in and disseminating this for us. Um, now let's move to, uh, we have an intervention with a hand raised from Dr. Emma Osong. So I'm going to unmute you. So please go ahead and um, ask your, your intervention or question. Thank you, Treyer. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Michael, for this brilliant presentation. Um, one of the challenges that I, I find with discussions around peace and some of the data that goes with it is really how collectively we understand peace, um, which is really around emotions, um, ideas about tranquility, inner harmony or societal harmony. I struggle with this um, as the, as the focus when we're talking about um, our, our existence in the world and often wonder why, why the focus or the thrust is not around the justice, global justice index. Because from your own uh, presentation, all the pillars of peace, as the, the, the previous, um, intervention pointed is around elements that speak about just institutions, just communities, just states. Uh, the reason I, I pick this up is not really to split hairs, but to say, is, is there a reason really why we just don't surgically go to the elements of justice as our indicators of um, quote, living in peace and harmony rather than speaking about peace per se. Now, um, after that, I, I am curious, as an American of Southern Cameroon's descent, when I looked at your map, that some of the sub-Saharan countries are um, come up as a medium global peace index. Uh, it seemed to me as though the squeaky wheel often gets the attention because you have countries that have long running um, environments that lack all of the pillars of positive peace, yet they are represented as medium uh, on the global peace index. So I am curious whether it's just a matter of visibility uh, or um, there are other underlying factors. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Emma. So um, I think on the societal harmony um, front, we're very much trying to, to measure and focus on the same thing. So, um, for example, if we look at sort of the 23 indicators, and, and of course, part of it is, is part of the challenge in many ways is that invariably um, different cultures around the world would, in, would, uh, would intuitively understand social harmony as, as being different things, right? Uh, if you are looking at a, an Islamic culture uh, or a Christian culture um, or this culture or that culture, the interpretation of, of harmony and what's required for it is actually, is actually quite quite different um so that in itself is an inherent challenge from a comparability perspective so the index tries to use things like um let's say violent crime and homicide as the best proxy of levels of societal harmony right the assumption is um that a peaceful country requires you know has no crime uh requires no jails um a peaceful country is socially harmonious if there is crime between neighbors, if there is conflict or is, if there is violence and, and abuse, then there is a, a lack of societal harmony. So it's our best effort to measure that um, in a globally comparable way. Uh, one of the countries, one of the, sorry, questions in the, um, or one of the indicators is actually um, based on the Gallup World Poll, which is, um, do you feel safe walking alone in your town at night? Um, so again, it's, it's sort of, um, it's it's trying to get us towards that idea of of understanding um, what are the the countries that are most socially uh, um, so on the justice uh, component. Um, I totally agree. I think you're you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I think probably um, justice again is perhaps uh, at least in some contexts a bit of a loaded word, which is why we don't we we perhaps don't. Um, use it. We'd sort of, you know, say, you know, strong pillars of positive peace or improving pillars of positive peace or the importance of, of looking into these different things or improving well-functioning government or improving the, fro the, the free flow of, of information, you know, um, actually, you know, connecting justice with free flow of information, you can, of course, do, but uh, a, just, a just free flow of information may not be as intuitive as, you know, a just just information versus free flow of information may not be so so intuitive. Um, so no, I don't think you're splitting hairs at all. And I think hopefully that the uh, that the pillars kind of sort of um, validate the importance of, of uh, the critical nature of justice across all of these. Um, on the global, um, on the map, um, I mean, that's always a challenge. Um, you know, this information can be taken and can be chopped and interpreted in a variety of different ways. We do our best to be very transparent in the methodology and the descriptions that we provide for all of our all of our reports. Um, you know, fundamentally, we try and sort of draw attention to not only the countries that need the most help, um, but also the countries that are doing the best so that we can uh, learn from them as much as we possibly uh, can. Um, but yes, at the same at the same time, I mean, depending on what people are looking for, people can find different things in there. Wonderful. Thank you both, Emma and Michael. Um, and we have a couple of questions from the chat from Evan. Um, and his question is around the peace index, uh, index and does it identify, quote unquote, good governance? And can that contribute to peace? both at the national and international levels? Um, are there points of intervention? So yes, the short of it is, is yes. When we um, statistically analyze peacefulness globally, leveraging the Global Peace Index, well-functioning government is what we call one of these core pillars of positive peace. A similar caveat to I provided for everything else is not the only thing, right? We're talking about uh, complex systems, um, but it can have an impact on all of the other pillars as, uh, as well. Um, and if we wanted to define what a well-functioning government would be, it would be precisely a government that ensures the acceptance of the rights of others, high levels of human capital, good relations with neighbors, low levels of corruption, a sound business environment, um, high levels of human uh, capital and the equitable distribution of resources. Wonderful. And we have a question um, regarding the consistently good scores in the top 10 most peaceful countries. What are some of those commonalities of, of factors that would contribute to that? 
uh, likewise, as opposed to the you know least peaceful and the bottom ten. So we do we do see in the index some countries that kind of sort of make a run a run up or a run down, um, and oftentimes that's because there's been some kind of sort of major shift, and uh, invariably it's kind of a bit like a pendulum. So you're sort of swinging back and you sort of settle somewhere in the index. And one of the things that we've noticed is that there doesn't tend to be a massive shift between the top and the bottom, and countries generally remain within within the same the same area. Again, the countries that are sort of generally more peaceful in in uh, in the global uh, peace index or showing improvements in peace are the ones that are particularly strong or showing improvements in these pillars of of positive peace. So I'd I'd refer back to uh, to that as well. So you know, over time, the but over time, the rankings in the global peace index and the positive peace index sort of sort of balance out, right? And when it's not balanced out, it's when there is an indication that something's happening, um, either for better, either for better or worse, which is what brings us to this sort of positive peace deficit and surplus model. And we have a, a raised hand for another intervention from Peter. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. And, and Peter, go ahead and ask your question. Peter, are you there to ask your question? You have, you have to give him permission again. He's... Hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right, my apologies. Um, I don't actually have a question. I was just trying to compliment uh, Michael for the good job he's doing uh, because this particular study, can you hear me? Can anyone hear me? Because I cannot hear yeah. you. Oh, okay. Yeah, because you this can hear particular, you loud and clear. Yeah, the particular study that he's busy extraying, I have taken this studies uh, the theoretically uh, to... Um, disaster.org it's actually a major study on that disaster.org and exactly everything the index the numbers everything he's extraying it's uh what i read and i got a certificate from and i just want to applaud the um the organization and the put together of the seminar thank you very much thank you peter that's very kind absolutely um and then uh, we'll have a, we have another, I think, time for one more question here um, from Lisa, um, who has a, a background in statistics and analytics, uh, is, are you using machine learning or AI to help find the correlations that you spoke about? And do groups affected by conflict use the data you provide to, you know, on that impact? So uh, increasingly, we are using AI, but not for when, uh, not for the original work that we've done for uh, for positive peace. So that's all. That's all very much the uh, the relational databases and the manual and the manual branching. We do increasingly use AI um, for different forms of data imputation, i.e., guessing um, estimates when um, uh, sort of subnational or national estimates aren't available. Uh, the ecological threat report, which is this report we're going to be launching on. Um, on Monday, uh, actually, uh, breaks down the world in, in three different, three over three thousand sort of um, administrative units at the state or provincial level. So um, AI can help close some of those gaps. Uh, we've recently re uh, released a report on the military capabilities, and we've leveraged machine learning and, a and AI to come to better estimates of the overall capability or the differences between third and fourth generation, you know, fighter aircraft, for example, and the implications for for um, for, for global superpowers. Um, so increasingly, yes, we are. Um, our experience with that, with AI um, is, is being um, so, so <laughs> it's, it's still quite, still quite basic. It still needs a lot of checking, but for, for the grunt work, uh, for lack of a better word, it can be very helpful indeed. Thank you. And uh, we are, we are nearing time, Michael, and we can't thank you enough for all of this, um, uh, your presentation, your, the the way you have engaged us um, in the questions and answer, um, and really this this important work that the Institute for Economics and Peace is doing, and how we think about peace 
uh, I'm, uh, we are so grateful here at Citizens for Global Solutions. And I just wanna uh, have a reminder for everyone of what Michael mentioned earlier about the hybrid event on Monday. It's hosted by the Stimson Center uh, for the Ecological Threat Report. Um, and my colleague will put the link in the chat again. And Michael, I'm already registered, so I will see you there online. Um, and I also want to thank our CGS team for behind the scenes to make this happen. So James May, our program officer, Hannah Fields, our communications officer. And again, thank you to everyone for attending today's global conversation events, your, your interventions, your questions, and we hope that you stay connected with us for future events. So thank you everyone. Bye. Take care everyone, bye.